It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Saraswathi Vedam. Saraswathi is the lead investigator for the Birthplace Lab at the University of British Columbia. She has been a clinician and a health professional educator for over 30 years. Professor Vadim has successfully coordinated multi-stakeholder community-led research projects in provincial and national settings. Her research projects include the National Canadian Institutes of Health-funded Canadian Birthplace Study that examines attitudes to place of birth among maternity care providers and Changing Childbirth in British Columbia, a provincial participatory study of women's preferences for maternity care. The Giving Voice to Mothers study explored experiences of respect, discrimination, and inequalities in access to quality care among communities of color and among those who plan home and birth center births. Professor Vadim is currently the principal investigator of a Canadian Institutes of Health research funded national research project to evaluate respectful maternity care. Research examining the stories of pregnancy and childbearing today, the RESPECT study. In 2017, she was selected as one of the inaugural Michael Smith Health Research Institute Health Professional investigators. Saras, I'm going to give the presentation over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's good morning where I am. I'm grateful to be sitting here on the beautiful, un, uh, traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish nations, the indigenous nations, particularly the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I am a guest on their land and grateful to be able to uh, to be with you today uh, at this time when we are uh, in an unprecedented uh, global acknowledgement of the power of uh, and the uncertainty of nature. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with you today uh, talking to you about what um, we do uh, as midwives when when we are faced with crisis and unexpected events and how we pivot and how uh, <clears throat> we are well poised to to bring some succor and some um, common sense and some fellowship to this moment. <clears throat> Many of you are aware that uh, in the global context, families uh, and 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 clinicians are questioning what happens when we have moved birth um, into facilities where there's a lot of exposure to each other, and so there is a spontaneous increased demand for home and freestanding. Uh, maternity unit care all over the world. We've been hearing about it in the UK, in India, in South America, uh, in um, nor the northern northern indigenous communities of uh, British Columbia, um, and in Africa, where people are not sure about. Uh, they want care. They want skilled attendant birth attendants. They've been um, exposed to the increases in in uh, wellness and well-being for themselves and their families when they have skilled attendants, but when the skilled attendants are all co-located, both the skilled birth attendants, the midwives, and the, uh, the populace are understandably concerned about, about exposure. Uh, because of diverting care to people who are sick with COVID and, and really symptomatic and where people who have been normally looking after childbearing families are, are repurposed uh, to look after those who are very sick, then there becomes a scarcity of care providers. In other settings where the midwives have been providing the care in facilities, sometimes even getting to the, the places where they work is difficult. There's also in the context of there's an involving evidence basis for the care of the childbearing families, should they come into the hospital, should they not, should they be um, <clears throat> wearing uh, personal protective um, gear, do they need to do that in community-based settings? Is it only for hospitals? 
you know, what what is happening about the incubation period? How much um, do we have to be concerned? And in fact, there's no local or global consensus on how to contain this as we, we it's constantly shifting. And it's difficult to social distance in shared or unstable housing when people are living in, in houses with many, many other people, particularly in low resource or in, low, in families that don't have uh, the other options. Um, there's challenges uh, with uh, social distancing every time you walk into an institution or the number of people you interact with. And what we're hearing all around the world, and this is what I'm really going to focus my remarks on today, is that there are uh, increases in violations of human rights throughout the childbearing cycle, right through the newborn per period that people are uh, experiencing. And that's in the context of uh, specialists also recommending separation of well from sick people. So how do, how do we respond to that and what, what can we do? Uh, to understand the context. I just want to point out that you know much of the discourse and the ability to rapidly put out guidance has come aside from the WHO. A lot of it has come from uh, countries that have a lot of resources, they have communication systems, they have ways to use um, uh, multiple systems to put out guidance and complex uh, you know, evidence and analysis. But much of the world is uh, are facing pregnancy and childbirth in these kinds of situations where they do not have uh, the ability to isolate even when they're in labor, they don't have uh, private rooms and nor do the midwives have access to things like personal protective equipment or the ability to stay distant. In some settings, you labor postpartum and give birth in, in wards that really uh, you're sharing even a, a bed. And these are, these are um, images that have come from uh, around the world that are, are quite current. So that's just to put it in the, in the context. Now, when we know that the WHO as early as 2016 has shifted its focus from clean water and uh, skilled birth attendance, it has included the experience of care as a fundamental and essential component to quality safety, to reducing fetal, uh, fetal neonatal and maternal mortality, that you need to have functioning referral systems, effective communication, that the respect and pres preservation of uh, dignity are core to quality. And it's not just an also or an additional thing, but it actually has everything to do with whether people feel like they can access care and feel safe uh, and that cultural safety and emotional safety has to do with how labor progresses and how what outcomes and whether or not people will um, trust the recommendations that are offered to them so that includes competent motiv motivated personnel and the availability of physical resources of course but also the application of the best available evidence that we have around quality of care so what we know is that if we look at um, previous pandemics, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about today about the situation that we're all in right now, but I, I want to remind all of us that that this is just one in a, a number of uh, crises that we've developed, uh, we've faced before. And often the crises, whether they're floods or earthquakes or uh, like the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014 to 2016, those uh, crises have, have have affected most sharply the uh, people who live in the in, in circumstances where they have the least resources and the least ability to um, to access high quality care with all the bells and whistles. They're in in low resource or middle resource settings where. Um, People are unable to access uh, antenatal care visit, visits, um, birth skill, birth attendance, or equipment. During the Ebola ep epidemic, um, the use of reproductive and maternal health care services plummeted so much that maternal and neonatal deaths and stillbirths indirectly caused by the epidemic outnumbered the direct Ebola deaths. And that's an important thing to remember at this moment. Women were unable to access family planning, completed fewer antenatal care visits were more likely to be, give birth without skilled birth attendants. And some people stopped going to facilities because of fear of uh, 
increased um, infections, others because of financial barriers or transportation barriers, others were denied care if they were suspected of having Ebola, as many facilities were not equipped to provide uh, care to people who were uh, infected and didn't want to in increase the contagion. That's the same situation that we're in right now. In uh, uh, very recently, some researchers, uh, the, uh, the Stein, Ward, and Catelmo, used the save, live saves tool to uh, to model what it would look like over the next year in places like Indonesia, India, Nigeria, and Pakistan, if if we do not think about how we can reorganize and reallocate care. These four countries are the most populous and low and middle income countries in the world. They account for almost a third of the world's growth population. And as you can see from this slide, the uh, impact of the additional deaths from COVID-19 service use, the decrease in their service use is, is huge. It's, it's uh, you know, so, so, uh, disturbing that this is just about access really it's about what we can do uh, when all of the care has been centralized what happens when people don't access that care on the ground we hear we're hearing in indigenous places and people who are rural and remote that uh, if they are in a remote and rural uh, setting where they are, they are COVID fee free and they don't have the pandemic. If they uh, have to be relocated to give birth, they have both the, the risk of contracting COVID themselves and bring it back, bringing it back to their communities later. Also, they cannot no longer bring the support systems and the culturally safe ceremonies that, that make their labors and births uh, more smooth because of the con because the system-wide concerns about um, too many people present. In large cities where they were not prepared uh, for social distancing and really aren't able to, especially in, in black and brown communities and in immigrant refugee communities and communities where they, uh, they are co-located at home and at work uh, it, with lots of people, uh, we know that the impact has been very great and that uh, is yet to come to, to Mumbai and to see what, what's going to happen. We know even in London, where there's very different, different birth stress are responding differently. We have uh, different types of uh, prevalence rates, impact. Uh, in New York City, they are now beginning in public hospitals to screen everybody, every maternal, uh, every pregnant person who comes into the hospital and they're finding something like a 38 percent COVID positive uh, rate. Not all of them are symptomatic but it's uh, throughout the population. In low and middle income countries we've heard from Uganda, Mal Malawi, Colombia, Pakistan, many of these places and they're rapidly shifting their systems to try to cope with what might be coming down the, the pike. So and we know that in high resource countries, there's very, very different responses depending on whether you're in the Netherlands or the UK or Canada or Spain or Italy. And that in all of those situations, marginalized communities are the ones who are uh, most at risk for, um, for receiving late or no prenatal care, having uh, more experience, more likely to experience mistreatment, loss of autonomy and decision-making, loss, of, lack of continuity of care. That is consistent with what we've seen throughout time. It's not uh, something new, but it's more sharp now. And so we're more, this challenge sort of increases the impact on our most marginalized communities and really requires rethinking, re-engineering the system that drives disparities so that when, when we focus on the needs of the most vulnerable, that we can, in fact, get it right for everybody. Interestingly, we can also learn from those communities and how they have, have provided for themselves uh, mechanisms and community-based solutions that have uh, filled the gap that healthcare systems have not. The National Quality Forum uh, produced a roadmap for promoting health equity and eliminating and disparities, and they talked about some of these interventions, which I'm going to talk to you about. So, 
We've done uh, research, as uh, Cecilia mentioned, on uh, what, it, what care looks like, uh, both in, in high-resource countries like North America, where I have studied with, uh, in collaboration with communities of color, what uh, their experience of care looks like. And we've also done it in low- and middle-income countries quite a lot. Megan Boren and her colleagues published just this past year, and we published two studies that talked about one in six um, families who, uh, who um, experience, sorry, my slides are not device advancing. So one in six uh, uh, pregnant women, people, have ex experienced uh, mistreatment in uh, the United States um, overall. Now, if you looked just at the uh, communities of color and just if people who had uh, lower resources, had challenges in their life, maybe they were homeless, uh, that that rate went to two in six. And that is consistent with the one in three um, rate of mistreatment that has been found in low and middle income countries. So it's really, it's the same. It's, it doesn't matter if you're a high resource, middle resource or low resource, people who have less uh, less ability, le they're marginalized, they're not in the mainstream and they're not uh, well resourced themselves in their families, they're more at risk for this kind of mistreatment. So what's linked to mistreatment? We know if you're an immigrant, if you uh, have low socioeconomic status, if you have some sort of pregnancy risk or social risk, maybe you come from a um, non-dominant uh, identity of, of any kind. It might be that you have um, an LGBTQ identity, it might be that you have a disability, it might be that you are homeless or, or um, live in, in a situation where the people around you are just not the same. That's definitely a written list and we've been showing shown this that also the types of birth that you have and how much interventions you have that that the uh, being shouted at, being scolded, being uh, your your request for help being ignored, uh, physical and verbal abuse increases every time there are more unexpected events that happen. And we know that in many of these situations, the, the midwives and the physicians who are involved are themselves disenfranchised. They don't have the equipment, they don't have the resources to be able to provide the care they want to, and everybody's anxiety is up. So what can we do in, in, in this context? You know, what can, how can we respond to, uh, to think outside the box? And maybe this is a moment, certainly at a moment right now where we want to uh, respond to the increased demand for community-based care. We want to have evidence-based strategies placed in, in place to triage to hospitalization when we have people who are sick or who are not sick with COVID, but who have some condition or um, situation either the mother or baby could benefit from the additional equipment or personnel that a hospital has to have to offer. So this is about appropriate triage. Interestingly, midwives also already are well set up to do that. In most situations, they know how to set up and run freestanding maternity units. Uh, they know how to attend people in low resource settings. They know how to do community at birth. And when they don't, when there are midwives who are in countries where that hasn't been normative and where their role has been mostly facilitated at birth, they know how to attend normal birth uh, without a lot of bells and whistles because most of undisturbed or, and birth that's physiologic happens without that. Now, there may be some task shifting and upskilling that needs to happen. I'm gonna tell you about places that have learned how to do that and done it in a very rapid way. Uh, we also know how to uh, repackage our supplies and uh, keep infection control um, within community settings. And uh, there are standards for equity, access, and respect and quality that are, in, are core to the values and the ways that midwives have worked from the beginning of time. So we're poised to partner, not just with the specialists, but also with the community health workers who've been doing this. I'm going to just flip through these next few slides fairly quickly to show you that there is a lot of evidence 
behind the midwifery approach to respectful maternity care. And when I'm call it, talking about respectful maternity care now, I'm talking about 12 domains, which includes access to equipment, access to PPE, access to clean water, access to the basic quality things that we think of when we attend people through pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum that include that that is a, a measure of respect also when people can access that that type of care but it's also how people are treated we know that uh, there are many many there's a lot of guidance that's come out this this guidance which i'm showing you here that comes from all over the world has been put out very rapidly in the last month and it all supports the fact that inclusion of persons in decision making, ensuring the presence of a companion through labor and birth, not separating uh, parents from their babies, even in crisis situations, those are all supported by best quality evidence, by uh, people who have looked very carefully at how to uh, attend to the needs and the health and the disparities and outcomes that we're seeing for marginalized uh, uh, families, we know that if we address those things, the 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 uh, the outcomes improve, and then people also access care and are able to do so in a in a safe way, safe medically, safe culturally, safe emotionally, safe ongoing for their long term health. So prioritizing um, prioritizing community based birth in places where they're supported by the healthcare system, right now can be rapidly done. For places that haven't been traditionally supported by the healthcare system, we need to think about how we can transform thinking about delivery of care in ways that they've always done when they've had war or earthquakes or floods or pandemics. We know that prioritizing breastfeeding best practices helps long-term health and immediate health and well-being for babies and mothers. We know that we're limiting the use of, of unnecessary interventions, using them certainly, but using them when they're medically indicated, thinking about the fact that every intervention, whether it's an early induction or an epidural, every single time means more requirement for more scarcely available right now healthcare providers and more people involved, more pe nurses and midwives who have to start IVs, who have to counsel, who have to monitor how that those um, interventions are being, uh, being delivered so that there are more people involved. If on the other hand, you bring in a companion and the companion can do that uh, close, continuous support, then the uh, healthcare provider is free to look after the people who really need them uh, more more often and also be a little bit more distance, not have to do provide that that care. And that's been supported by the WHO and many situations that having a single supportive companion can benefit everybody, including reducing exposure for providers as well as um, as well as the, the population. So <clears throat> Seamless access to receptive hospital environment is, when needed, is key to that. We know that expert consensus guidance also talks about trusting community responders. So I'm not talking necessarily about, there are of course amazing uh, transport people and people who are uh, actually taking, uh, taking people from the uh, community to facilities. And many of those in India, there are, uh, community health workers who are being paid $50 a month and their job is to help do the home visits and take people to facility when they need to and identify when people need to be accessing care, even postpartum, they do postpartum care. And they haven't stopped doing that work. They're, they're not being paid, they're not, uh, they're not uh, employees of the government, but they have, they're basically volunteers and they're still doing it. In what we find in places like, um, uh, whether it's looking after uh, low resource people in the United States or low resource people and immigrants and refugees in, in refugee camps or in, all through Europe, in the UK, in the Netherlands or in Africa or the Philippines, we find that these community members have rapidly pivoted 
they have uh, started to bring food hampers. They've used the elders in the way they need. They have always been used to do ceremony and to do blessings, but they're, they've figured out how to keep those uh, elders on Zoom and how to use te telehealth in ways that have been very rapid and responsive in what that that haven't been able to be done in the large health health systems because they're they are they have to be nimble and they have to react and they have to figure it out. They have not, however, left to the side the importance of ceremony, respect, fellowship, food, basic services. That's where they're putting their energy, and that's what we can learn from when we are in partnership with communities. <clears throat> So we are safer together. I want to draw you. I know this is hard to hard to see this um, the slide, but I want to draw your attention to the um, to the uh, the uh, bucket that's under NGOs and media. It says share evidence based information with women and families. Integrate. Uh, Integrate learning from women's experiences of pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum to continuously inform decision makers, collect and share examples of best out-of-the-box practices that can be implemented in other settings. I just put to you that as midwives, we can do that as well. It's not just about NGOs. We know we work in partnership with, with, um, with families all the time. And one of the things that we have done is set up a transdisciplinary, uh, a, a transdisciplinary uh, task force to look at quality maternal and newborn care, to look at what the precedents are for rapid uh, review of human rights and also strengthening health systems. There's models that exist for how do you strengthen health systems in times of crisis. And so what we've done is put together a uh, large group of people. Uh, in fact, they have self, they have volunteered themselves to, to join us, and we do have uh, people from all over the sector, all over the world, and also um, people who are across obstetrics, midwifery, human rights, infectious diseases, pandemic and disaster planning, community health, global health organizations like the WHO. Several of us are working on implementing these strategies in our own uh, jurisdictions, and we believe there's a benefit to sharing our insights. insights. Once we have figured out what these templates are, how do you mobilize a hotel? How do you take community-based providers and help them extend the healthcare system by doing postpartum visits or prenatal visits or, or triage? How do you take doulas and have them uh, go, doulas who are culture matched, who are trusted members of the communities, or maybe they are traditional birth workers, or maybe they are traditional midwives, and have them do the screening and uh, COVID testing even, or taking food or take or helping them mobilize transportation so they can access care when they need, need to. We know that this is happening all over the world and many of the people who've come to this task force have brought their examples. They've already set up protocols and standard operating. They've figured out how to reallocate call schedules, how to take uh, people who, midwives who are working in hospital settings and give them the skills and the confidence to provide the same care in, in communities for healthy, well people, and then how to limit the, the transfers to those who really need it. Uh, they've also uh, figured out how to work with policymakers and um, health systems to make sure that the human rights are preserved. We know that happened in New York where initially people were not being allowed to have a companion and that was taken through policy and that's happened in the UK, it's happened in India and in, in, in Kenya. So uh, our goal is to uh, make a, an accessible resource. It will be uh, accessible by uh, many, to many different, uh, many different levels and you will see um, this is a slide that shows you uh, a model that someone, uh, uh, in, some group of researchers in 2017 put together where if you click on any one of those circles, it will bring up uh, all of the evidence or the strategies that you, that are relevant to that sector of the, so you may be a midwife, you may be a community health worker, you may be a policymaker, where can you get the template 
or the, the protocol or the call schedule or the PPE that you're looking for. And this would this kind of tool would rapidly put that in the hands. And we're working, we, our goal is to work with a technology partner so that it's available through mobiles, it's a, it, mobile phones, it's available to through um, uh, in places where we don't have Zoom or connectivity, but maybe there is a, a way for people to get it uh, through telehealth or through systems that are now being put into place. Uh, Multi-level, so maybe you're very remote, you don't have that and you need it in a, uh, a hard copy uh, form. So we can produce that, we have the technology we have. If we can put our global minds and our expertise together and work in a transdisciplinary way, I believe it can be done now to transform health systems and access for those who are most uh, marginalized which will then improve access for all ongoing, not just through during a pand pandemic. Uh, maybe it'll live on a Sorry. website. Yes. Uh, you asked me to give you a time when it's 25-2. It's 25-2. Okay, yes, I'm, I'm moving, moving. I'm, I'm getting there. So thank you for that. Okay. That. So uh, <clears throat> we have organized our work into committees. We have an operations and logistic committee, uh, clinical workforce recruitment, community health linkages. We are have a, uh, a subcommittee that's working on legal advocacy and human rights, training and support, of course, evaluating what we're doing and also how to make this strategic policy and acceptability, uh, really being realistic that, that, that in order to rapidly change, we need the buy-in at every level, including community members. And so there's a communications uh, mandate there. These people are not trying to reinvent the wheel. They are looking at what's already out there. What's working in indigenous communities? What's working in black communities or in rural India or in Colombia? What has been working in, in Kenya or uh, for, for in any of these sectors for reserve, res respecting and preserving human rights, for giving access to clean water, to uh, food, to transportation, to seamless, uh, access to hospitalization when people need it. What can be then shifted back out to the community with community health workers? Uh, what can we do now to respond in a crisis time that then can inform the future? Uh, <clears throat> so we have already, I'm gonna just flip through quickly and show you some of the things that we've gathered. We have best practice guidelines for interprofessional collaboration, both between community midwives and specialist providers and that is throughout the course of reproductive health, but also uh, how um, how that can be done during the moment of transfer. What everybody's roles are, what their responsibilities are. There's sort of a template. There are, uh, we have a, a training resources around how to do person-centered decision making and how to rapidly teach that online. We have uh, policy guidance from the ICM, from from the WHO, from uh, the birth rights uh, uh, folks. We have a tracking uh, system. So this is from uh, Elephant Circle, which is an organization that has set up a rapid response tracking system to report violation. And you could be a midwife, you could be a doula or a birthing person, but then you can then uh, log in from anywhere in the world and say, you know, describe what you witnessed. Did you witness something directly? What did the mistreatment include? It's already set up according to the WHO guidelines for what mistreatment, the buckets that it looks for. You can describe it in as much detail as you want. You can do it anonymously and you can talk about where it goes and start to provide uh, some accountability and understand the prevalence. What we're talking about is really re reaching that critical consciousness in your own practice to appreciate the context that you uh, live and then take this moment to illuminate those power struggles and move beyond the day-to-day -day procedural, but in fact, think about how social justice and um, understanding the uh, the need, you know, we all understand the needs of our clients, but what can we do at this moment to transform access, respect, care, and quality for those people in our communities who are least likely to be able to access it? So uh, I've, in my own practice, have um, uh, uh, um, I have a website, so I started to, to gather and put up the WHO um, guidance. Uh, we have in BC a lot of wonderful guidance around coordination of care, 
Uh, so I just put that in a way that, that is accessible to my community who wants to get it. Of course, it needs to be more globally uh, uh, accessible. There are five approaches that the White Women Alliance has brought forward, and they have talked about these very simple things that you yourself can do, and that is promoting the right to respectful maternity care and <clears throat> mobilizing the communities to around respectful care and recognizing that respect includes access to care, access to PPE, access to companions, access to care when they're depressed, when they're alone, when they're postpartum, all the way through. They've done this in Nigeria, they've done it in Nepal and, and in Kenya, they've in, integrated this. So if they, we can do it there, we can certainly do it in more high resource settings where we have much more, many more tools. Also supporting healthcare providers, we should not set up these false di di dichotomies between client, patients and providers. Everybody needs uh, to be protected and needs to understand their emotional safety as well. And they, you know, healthcare providers have families and have to think about what they can do. So values clarification, clarification and attitude transformation has to do with us respecting everybody in the system. And then incorporating the respectful maternity care um, uh, into policies, we have we are going to give you with through this task force. We're going to give you the, the the letter, the template for the letter that you can take to your local government, state health department, or your um, your through your own systems and adapt them as you want. We've done it in the past. It's been done in Nepal. It's been done all over the world. So, if you want to learn more about that and um, keep in touch. You can go to the birthplace.lob.org if you want to just be informed about what the Global Task Force is bringing forth at this moment and what you can do at your level. You can go to birthplacelab.org slash global dash task dash force. Um, we can put that up for you. And um, we look forward to your input and uh, to our, our fellowship. Yeah, this is one moment where in fact we are all we're all in the same boat and we need to mobilize the expertise that we already have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saraswathi. We have about seven minutes for questions. Um, there was an initial quick question. The photos in your early slides, where were those from? They look like they might be Africa. Yes, uh, uh, one uh, was from, um, uh, and the first one is from an African country. Um, I believe it was uh, Kenya. It might have been Malawi. Um, and it was some years ago when I when I uh, was given that by a photographer. And the other one is from the Philippines. Thank you. Um, Saras, tell us a little bit more. There was a grid about a project that you're working on that would also become available on cell phones where you hit the button and it gives information. Yeah, so that we are that's what we're building now with the Global Task Force is a, 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 a matrix that allows you to locate yourself. Maybe you're a community health worker, maybe you're a community midwife, maybe you're a hospital based midwife, maybe you are uh, a health policymaker or a, uh, a lawyer, and you can locate yourself. You can say, I'm in a rural or a ur large urban setting. I am interested in rights or I'm interested in access to PP or the evidence. And then you can find the area uh, in this grid where you want to go and find the documents that will help you move the needle forward in your own context in your own role. Now, what we will probably ultimately pr uh, produce will not, that that grid was produced by researchers to pull together the research around community health interventions. Uh, that grid is a complex grid and not really accessible to the average person. So we are gonna, we are, our goal is to, to partner with technology, with a te a technical technology experts to, to turn something like that into a, web-based tool or a mobile-based tool that could be clickable or searchable very easily to bring you right to your cell phone or to your context, the documents that you need or the template for the letter or the 
step-by-step uh, -step protocol, how to change your call schedule or how to repackage your birth supplies, you can find it how you want to. And that's what we're trying to produce in a rapid way uh, over the next few months. Thank you. There's a question from Jenny Hall. What is being done in your education practice to help improve respectful care? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have um, uh, uh, content. So in, I'm a, a midwifery educator, and in the university where I am, we have um, uh, content all the way through the curriculum that addresses what equity looks like and that equity is not the same as equality. And that in, in fact, uh, we have some resources. We have uh, co online courses and content that has been developed by our indigenous partners that uh, help all of us, not just our students, but our faculty members also to understand about communication. I, I put up a slide uh, a few slides ago around a person-centered decision-making. I can bring it back up for you. Um, uh, it's the wheel that has uh, person-centered decision-making. That is part of a course, an online course that is uh, delivered to physicians, midwives, nurses, anybody who wants to. It's, and it can, it can be done uh, non-synchronous in these small groups where they, they're interprofessional groups and they learn how to communicate with each other as well as how to communicate around the family and keep the family's goals and values and uh, priorities at the center as opposed to our own agenda and how to attend to those power imbalances and of course document it and revise the plan as necessary but it's a step-by-step -step process that we teach uh, our our students it uh, respect is a large um, word and it may be uh, about communication it may be about how you ask permission before touching it may be about attending to their cultural context uh, and doing anti-racism training. All of that needs to be done. I would say we're on a journey. We're certainly not uh, perfect at it ourselves. Um, one more quick question, and then we'll need to start closing off the session. Um, several people are asking, um, all these activities by government and non-governmental organizations there's still a lack of supplies and personal protective equipment. Cyrus, what would you say your um, one target for action there would be? Yes, uh, so we will have as part of our, um, our resources how, how you can work with your government and um, health systems to, to change that. But since that it is not a rapid thing, we also will provide uh, guidance around personal PPE that can be made uh, in simple ways. Some of that is on my website already uh, on, if you go to the last slide, the web uh, birthplacelab.org and you go to the COVID thing, you'll see there's some guidance around um, making personal protective in, in, uh, with very, very simple uh, materials that are available globally. Uh, we don't have testing about what, uh, you know, what is, uh, perfect PPE, but we know that there are some guidance around negative ion materials that can be used, that the plastics and things that uh, that are available all over the world in the world that where people can and and in India they are making those PPEs themselves. Communities are making it, and community health workers are making it for themselves. So um, I think uh, we don't know uh, everything about that, but we know that just simple masks and eye covers are what's necessary, and I think that. Uh, it's possible to do it to do it uh, in collaboration with our communities who can who are not health workers but can make those things and are doing it. Saris, thank you so much. Um, this has been a very informative presentation. I am going.